Uh, good morning, everyone. Morena. Um, if you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, please? Hebrews chapter 2. We're in a series, this is the third in the series, on what is called the Imago Dei. It's a Latin word meaning image of God. And as anyone who's gone through Sunday school will know that the answer to every question in church is Jesus. But sometimes we need to unpack what the question is that we're asking. How does Jesus answer the question of what this disfigured Imago Dei is? So we've learnt this concept that embedded in creation is the idea that humanity has a special place given to it by the Creator, that every individual bears this image of God. Every, every individual has a, a, a function or responsibility within our society and the place that we live, the creation that God has made, to bear the image of God. But in the fall, we turned our back on God and decided to go our own way. And we've seen how there, instead of the earth being filled with flourishing that was called for in Genesis 1 and 2, we get to Genesis 6. And do you remember what it was filled with? Violence, right? People were all wanting to make a name for themselves in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. When... It begins again after the flood. God says to Noah, he gives this command, you know, that you can't take, somebody can't take the life of another person. There has to be a severe punishment for it. Why? Because anyone in humanity is made in the image of God. We see it continued on. We see it in, in Judges. It says, in Judges, I think it's 25, it talks about how the, Israel had no king, so everybody just did things that was right in their own eyes. We see Solomon in Ecclesiastes, someone who had this great wealth and great power, and he, and he used it just to try all of these things, and yet trying to find something that filled his heart, filled the heart, his heart with desire, he just looked at it and said, it's all, there's a meaninglessness to it, right? So we all see all these things at play that question who I am and how I fit, and what is my I identity, to use a more modern word with that. So what I want to do today is we kind of pivot a little bit in this series, and this will um, pick up the task in the next couple of weeks, really, what it is, was to say, well, Jesus enters into this space now, and what is it, what is the question that he is answering in his personhood and his work? And that's why we're in Hebrews chapter 2, because it lends this... Um, uh, this l lovely passage about how we're not what we're meant to be, but, but in Jesus we, we see this, the answer of what we should be and, 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 and following him. But what I want to do is, um, a substantial bit of today is to go, what is it that is the, the lie or the mistruth or the twist that's happened that we try and find from ourselves or from the world that this Imago Dei concept is trying to reconstitute. And this idea is, well, where do I, f if, if identity is important, who I am is important, what my role is, what my function is, if that is an important question to ask, and everybody here knows that it is because you're all asking it, and everybody in our world is asking it and trying to find an answer to it, then, then where are those places without God, that I might look for it. And we'll just look at some frameworks that might help us in that understanding. Hebrews 8, which we're going to leverage off a little bit um, uh, in this, sorry, Psalm 8. Um, Psalm 8 that Hebrews 2 references looks to the heavens and says, when I look at all this vastness, I feel so inconsequential. When I look at it all, what is it about me that's in place? Let's read Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 1 says this. We may, must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. I include that verse because it's such an important element of what is at play in the book of Hebrews. The writer there is concerned that there's these ones who have heard the truth, but there's a drifting away from the truth 
that he unpacks there, and he keeps bringing people back to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Unless you understand why Jesus came, what he did, what he accomplished, then there's always the potential there for a drifting away of this. Verse 5. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, which is Psalm 8, says this. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. You put everything under their feet. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. So we see here what we've talked about in our understanding of Amago Day here, that the place of humanity that God gave to mankind to pick up this idea, to rule within the creation that he had made, but to rule with the idea of it, of it flourishing, flourishing for the, the, the creatures that exist within it, but also the humanity that would be there, part of it, should be a blessing to everything that is there. And yet in a great understatement there at the beginning of verse 8, it says this. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. This is this disfigurement that has taken place in the Imago Dei within individuals, but corporately as, as humanity, that we all have this disfigurement through the rebellion, through the fall. We all do it. And therefore, when we look out in our world, we don't see what should be there in place with it. So let's think about that, about where elements that are in play that might twist our idea of who we are and where we find our place of importance or our place of identity. So we talked about this idea that there were three elements at play here when we think about being made in God's image. There's a substantial one, the idea that everyone bears an importance because they are made in the image of God. And therefore, violence should be not, not be done against them. But it also is this idea that there's a capacity which humankind are given, which if they come under the subjugation of God and submit to his will and his authority, that would lead to be able then to rule with the right humility and holiness and justice. There's always a relational element to it. We're, we're, we're made in God's image to be able to relate to God, and we're made in a way that is meant to function in a way of relating to others. And then there's this functional element. There's something that I'm meant to do. There's something that how I'm meant to act. In the original creation, it was in the idea of, of cultivating the land and looking after the garden. But as it progresses through Scripture, we see this this idea that it is a role that I play that has more moral or ethical or character-based ones with it, particularly as it picks it up in the New Testament. Think of them in this way, the substantial, who I am, where I fit, what I do. Three rather important questions, aren't they? (laughs) Critical questions that all of us are asking and all of us are answering And all of us are answering based on what we think is important or based on the information as we put it through our filters. And so what I want to do next is I'm going to take you through some frameworks um, within which uh, you might think about how you form your identity. And um, uh, there was an author by the name of Robert McGee who wrote a book called The Search for Significance. And if you're into reading books, and uh, it's uh, one I would highly recommend. I think it's very good. And in there, he, um, he does a little equation where he calls self-worth. I'm gonna, it's deeply connected to identity, so I'm just going to use that idea. And he equates it with two elements. The first one he said was performance, which I think is one of the frameworks. So I'm just going to call it whatever your framework is, plus other people's opinions. What your framework about how you form or think about your identity and who you are and other people's opinions in it. So let's look at the the frameworks. The first one is, and I'm just using the same Imago Dei elements idea at play with this, 
This is a very quick version of it. We could spend a lot of time on each one, but just, just let me give some frameworks to, as an idea. The first one is this idea of a tribal frame. And uh, this is the idea that um, I, I don't think of myself as an individual or an identity. In fact, a lot of people would think that's a very modern way of, of thinking about it. So you go to someone with, in a tribal frame and you say, who are you as an individual? They go, what kind of, it's not even a question. I, 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 don't, I don't think of myself in that way. I think, I think of myself as somebody that sits within a wider group a tribe, right? And the imp- what I think about as important is the importance of what the tribe needs. What are the tribal needs? So I submit myself to what the needs of the tribe are. I don't think of myself as a, someone with individual desires per se. So when I think about what I do is what my tribe tells me to do. And wh- where I fit is this idea, well, it's my tribe, isn't it? Who, who I belong to. So you could historically think of this as a group. You might think of it in a village kind of setting with it, and it's people deeply connected to the land, and they have to work in together and look after one another and uh, grow their crops and store them up. There's a historic kind of one with it, but it's a deeper framework of thinking than just a historic one with it. And it's a very helpful framework on, on a number of kind of fronts with it, but there's a number of, of cultures and places and communes and even cults around the world that that live and exist in this way. And there can be some downsides with this, right? It generally has a very hierarchical structure in it. There's somebody or a small group who are in charge who determine what the group thinks and does, positively or negatively. We really struggle with this properly in our modern age because we think of ourselves as individuals and we think of ourselves and our desires and our thoughts and our opinions as important. So we would struggle in this framework if we have to come under somebody else in this situation. If the person who is in charge falls for whatever and there's a leadership vacuum in place, then there'll be a battle for control. Because the idea is, if I want to be the one who is in control, so I can be the one who determines what what uh, exists within it. This is a tribal framework that can exist. I think one I've just called industrial frame. And this is starting to think more of myself as an individual. But who I am now is measured by my success, or by what I acquire. So this might be... um, wealth, material things, whatever in that, in that kind of situation. But it could also be relationships. I measure my success, who I think about myself, with the number of friends that I have, right? There could be another fra- a number of frameworks that think about it. We're currently seeing this framework in a certain uh, sporting competition happening around the other side of the world, right? There's a number of the athletes there, it's, watching the 100 meters um, in the last couple of days, and you, you, you do a false start, you're gone. And you watch these ones, and they're so devastated. Years of training and competition, and they don't even get to run. And we, we know what happens here in this instance, right? Because I'm, I'm measuring success by what I, what I do, what I achieve, what I gain. What I, so I was thinking of myself as an individual, but it's, the, it's, it's what I... What, what I can point to, my performance in that way. And so where I fit is an interesting one in that because it's a competitive environment, isn't it? Think about that for a moment. My, my performance, therefore, changes how I view people, how I view things, how I do, view stuff. And I put a column there about validation, this idea of where do I get my validation from this of of have I succeeded or do I feel good about myself with it? And I put in there this idea that it's 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 fans, however you describe that with them in that place. We can think of this with celebrities, right? I think about myself in a way is dependent about how this group that I uh, that I set in place. And so you can see some difficulties that can come in place with this, right? The third one we'll spend a little bit more time in, and this is a one that has really developed and is an incredibly strong influence in our modern society. 
And this is the idea, there's all sorts of different words for it. The therapeutic or psychological frame, you might have heard it called expressive individualism. But who I am is something called the authentic self. There's, there's something in me, it's an elevation of the mind or particularly the feelings, there's some sort of feeling or some sort of core me that, that has been lost or destroyed is often the way they put it by institutions, society, however you sort of describe it. And I've got to, got, got to refine it. And when, when I, and so what I do is I search for my true self. And where I fit is, as I find my true self and I express it, where I fit is with those who approve of me. That's where I try and find my place. I put the validation as everyone. Let me explain that a little bit. Because it's quite an interesting element. Um, I didn't watch the Olympics opening ceremony, but I've heard a lot about it. Right? And um, there's debate, and there's people making all sorts of claims about <clears throat> a particular scene that was or wasn't a depiction of something. I think there's enough people who were involved in organizing it that it was a depiction of something. <clears throat> in fact, one of the main characters involved in it said, no, it was definitely a depiction of it. We want to have something new. It was like a gay New Testament, right? And so, so there was a depiction with it. But what was interesting in it, one of the people who were involved in it said this. <clears throat> they said, I want you to know that what you saw there, that was really good, but I want you to know that's not what France is like. France is not approving of all of this, we still have a lot of work to do. Now think about that for a moment. In some sort of great celebration of something, they were still this idea, haunted by the idea that there's still people out there who do not approve. And so validation is necessary by finding those who don't approve and con continuing to move towards a place where everyone gets approval. Now, why I'm pointing this out is because all of these different frames require an external validation. We think, or we're told, that this idea of, well, if I find my authentic and true self, shouldn't that be validation enough? But what we're finding is that more and more, it needs this external validation. That makes sense when you understand there's a creator who tells you who you are and who you should be. We would need that external validation that sits in place with us. Here's how one writer described it. it was, was, this was in the Huffington Post in a longer article, but this is a description that would ha be helpful. It's this heading, give yourself permission to be your true self. The person's name is Michael. I'm still becoming Michael, still discovering who I am and working at being true to myself. It's an exhilarating way to live, and I've discovered one mighty and liberating fact. It's okay to be me, and to want to be true to myself. Remember, you're the game changer. You're in charge. You're the boss of you. You set the ground rules and boundaries. No one else has that superb power or pleasure. No one else ever sh should live your truth. Right? So you hear this in all sorts of different ways and frameworks in it laid down. Notice a couple of very just quick things with it. The first one is this. It's very interesting. They're still discovering who they are. Did you notice that? It's an ongoing process that you never somehow get to the end to, or if it's some sort of thing inside of you and your feelings, the, the sands shift all the time of what they are. But they put this as idea, it's exhilarating and liberating and freeing. I would put to you, this is part of why we live in such an anxious world with so much anxiety in place because it's all on you to create it. It's debilitating. It's soul-destroying, right? Because we're meant to be named from the outside. I'll just quickly go through these. This is a, a, an, an author, Mark Sayers. Uh, he does a number of podcasts, an Australian guy, very good cultural commentator. I think I've probably mentioned him before. So he just gives these in his book, Disappearing Church. Um, I'll just go through them quickly without much comment. He said, in this idea, the highest good is individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. 
traditions, religions, received wisdom, regulations, and social ties that restrict the highest good must be reshaped, deconstructed, or destroyed. It's a key fact with it. The world will inevitably improve as the scope of individual freedom grows. Technology, in particular the internet, will motor this progression towards utopia. It's not going so well. The primary social ethic is tolerance of everyone's self-defined quest for individual freedom and self-expression. Any deviation from this ethic of tolerance is dangerous and must not be tolerated. Humans are inherently good. Large-scale structure and institutions are suspicious at best and evil at worst. Forms of external authority are rejected and personal authenticity is lauded, right? So these are the, th this is what we're seeing. This is a, quite, a, has a lot of explanatory power, right? But these frameworks are all in play. Don't get the idea that that's the only framework. These previous two are. But I just included a fourth one. In some senses, it's a subset of the third one, but it's a growing one, and I want you just, just to flag it because it might be helpful. This one is what's called the creative frame. See, the authentic self, expressive individualism, was a sort of a search. There's something inside of you that you find. But there's a problem with that, because if there's not something that you find, some sort of lost treasure of gold that, with an X marks the spot on it, it's problematic. Ah, but what if you say there's not something called the authentic self? What if a human being is just a blank slate? So now, instead of finding something inside yourself, you can create whatever you want to be. And you don't have to find something inside yourself to justify it. It's a shift. It's in the same frame of thinking, but it's a significant shift. We might talk about that a little bit more next week because you've got a lot of blank spaces in there. All right, so it's who I am as a blank slate. Create my true self now where I fit with those who approve of me, and the validation is, again, from everyone with it. Now, the problem with all of these, and there's some, you can say there's some good things within it and some frameworks there that you could fit within a religious kind of setting and a, and a biblical kind of framework. I get kind of that. But all of these, if you take God out of it and the idea that you're created in the image of God, all lead to massive problems. So let's come back to our text in Hebrews 2 and see what happens in here. And this is not, the contrast here is not Jesus tacked on to one of these frameworks. Jesus comes into this space and speaks across them all. He comes as a servant, but not to serve my, mankind's twisted wishes. He comes to serve mankind's desperate need. So the writer of Hebrews says this. This is all the problem that we see, but we do see Jesus. Who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Let's unpack that. The first thing it says is Jesus becomes a human. The description that was used there to describe human beings is now being used to describe Jesus. And right the way through Hebrews chapter 2, it, it's such a key passage for us understanding the ways that Jesus was made and was just like us on so many levels. But secondly, we see that he's not like us. There's no disfigurement there of the Imago Day. He's the divine I am, existing as a human being. He suffers, he's tempted, but he's without sin. He's all that we 
should have been. Some people have described it as Adam as humanity version 1.0, Jesus as humanity 2.0, 1.0 failed, we're all 1.0, but Jesus. And then it describes there, it uses the word perfect. Did you see that in, in verse 10? It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation. The word there, perfect, is, is best described complete or adequate. It's a little bit under thing, but for what he's going to do, he's going to save us all. And he's perfect for that, complete for that. And then it says he's this. He's a pioneer of our salvation. He's the one who makes it happen. He's the one who goes through first. And unless he goes through, none of us can follow with salvation. None of us can be saved unless he does it. He goes and dies in our place for our sin. So that we, you and I, can become again all that we were meant to be from the beginning. Mm. Thanks, brother. Now let's come back here. Because now we have a different frame. And I want you to understand how different this frame is. Because now it is Jesus, through God the Father saying who we are. And now I submit to him. It's not Jesus becomes and, and makes my wishes and makes up for sin. It's a whole reframing. Who I am now, I'm a child of God, made in his image and restored through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. What do I do? Well, I, I'm restoring the bearing of God's image by living in obedience. Do you hear that? Where I fit, I'm in relationship with the Trinitarian God, but I'm also loving my neighbor who is made in God's image. And here's a really important bit. The validation is this. The validation of who I am is through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. It changes everything about how I see myself and about how I relate to people in this world. And if we don't get that, then we will continue to try and find our identity within frameworks that are of this world and will always cause problems both for us as an individual and for the communities and societies that we live in. I cannot tell you how important and how culture offending this is. You are told in this world a great big lie about who you are and where your identity comes from. And the Bible corrects it in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's finish with this here without any comment and you'll see it picked up, all the things that we have just talked about. In the next two weeks, we'll just continue this thought and think about the application of what that means for us. But I wanted to start in this place here of where our identity comes from. See, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage that speaks so strongly into the lies that we can hear in our world. We have an identity already. It's 
been given to us by you as our creator God and then through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who was a faithful and merciful high priest who was able to go to that cross and in our place for our sin make atonement for us. And that through his example and through his forgiveness that we might be made holy, restore this function and capacity that should be present within each of us. Would you help us to deeply understand this truth that we may know who we are and know what we are called to do and to be. We pray this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.